Good morning and welcome to Church of the Lakes Online. Thank you for joining us this morning. We hope God speaks to you today through the teaching. To help you connect with Church of the Lakes, we have what we call an e-guide. If you go to our website at co2lakes.com, choose the three lines on the top right hand side, then click on what says e-guide. Thank you again for joining us this morning. Enjoy the teaching today and God wants to say something to you. God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church. The communion of saints. The forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the body. And the life everlasting. Amen. What do you believe? Good morning, church. Welcome to Church of the Lakes Online. We're so glad you joined us this morning. Uh, thank you for wherever you are. Um, you could be right here in Leesburg. You might be on the other side of the planet or on the north side uh, where y'all are having a little bit cooler weather while we are uh, in flames down here. Uh, it's hot down here. But anyway, welcome to church this morning. We're glad you're here. And uh, real quick, I just I just want to remind you, like they just told you, we've got the e-guide, so make sure you pull this up, cotlakes.com. And uh, everything's here. First time guests, you can let us know it's your first time with us. Small groups, sermon notes, next steps giving, etc. All of it is here. So, uh, but if it's your first time, welcome. I'm Pastor Mike. I'm the lead pastor here at Church of the Lakes and so grateful you are taking the time to join us or watch this video later on. Um, and, and I want to say real quick, uh, it's important for me to say this and I don't say it maybe as much as I should. I'm so grateful that you're here. I pray that God will use his words to speak into your life and into your heart, but I don't ever want to have online replace what I think is a necessity, and that is your involvement in a church. It may not be Church of the Lakes, and that's okay. Uh, but, but there's something about the fact that we're a body of Christ. What that means is you can't have the liver hanging out over here by itself. Uh, the liver won't survive out by itself. It needs the body. And so while I hope God speaks to you this morning, I also hope you won't use this just to replace being actively involved in God's church. So get plugged in somewhere. We'd love to have you at Church of the Lakes, but if God's calling you somewhere else, get there, serve, get under their pastor, and follow the vision and what God is calling them to do. So welcome, welcome. Uh, we've been doing a series, uh, but before I jump into the series, a couple quick announcements. We're doing something this summer called Summer Dinner Circles summer dinner circles. And it's basically just an opportunity for a relationship. Um, most people are crazy creatures of habit. What that means is they come in and they sit in the same place uh, on Sunday morning. Matter of fact, some people just think those are their seats, um, kind of a deal, which also leads to even though we do meet and greet, uh, they have a tendency to shake hands with the same people as well. So what we really want to do with these summer dinner circles is have someone open their home and be a host and then have 10 other people sign up and, and, and be a potluck. And the whole goal is, is that you would just get to know each other. 
that you would go around the circle and answer a few questions that we'll give you that will just let the people get to know you a little bit. So that way, when meet and greet comes at church, you know somebody else. You can walk a different way and shake their hand or you have a little bit. So it's all about relationships. So get involved with summer dinner circles. Uh, you can sign up for those or you can email us, call us, let us know here at the church office that you would be happy to host one. Uh, family game nights is coming in July. Family game nights is a favorite. And although it says family game nights, wanted to let you know all ages are welcome. All people are welcome. Singles, you are more than welcome. Each Sunday night of July, we pick some crazy game to play for example slip and slide kickball um, is, is is a really fun night um, and we pray that people don't break their tailbone um, falling when they hit on the slip and slide but it is a blast and so even if you are not someone who would play I promise you it's entertaining you bring a bring you a lawn chair put it out on the side and um, and, and and laugh uh, at the at the whole process and enjoy so look up family game nights it's all listed uh, we just listed on Facebook with all the different nights available but it's under events here uh, so come join us on family game nights and then last announcement I want to make Tay is we uh, we we have an amazing group of senior adults what we call our prime timers um, and our prime timers man they're a cool group of people they work so hard this past week they busted their behind on a new building that we are doing and they tore down drywall and took out studs I mean you should see the physical labor they did really cool group of people one of the things that, that they have just recently said that they would like to do or they have agreed to do is that if you are a 20s, 30s, 40s, maybe you're in that range and it's the, it's the kid years or it's the early marriage years or that kind of a thing, sometimes it would be really nice to have an older person to talk to, to pray for you, just to even check up on you. And so our prime timers would love to have some prayer partners. All they're asking is that if you would be interested, just let us know. Email us, send us some information, get on, you know, and just just let us know. I, yeah, I'd like a prayer partner. What they're going to do is maybe twice a month, just give you a phone call, right? They're not going to invade your life necessarily as much, but just a quick phone call to say, how can I pray for you today? What's going on? You doing okay? So if you'd like a prayer partner, I just want you to know we got some of our prime timers that are waiting for you. They're waiting for that opportunity to pray for you and uh, just be a support to you. So if that's you, please let us know. Okay. We are in a series that it's, it's one of these series, I just got to tell you that with every week we do the series, I'm loving this series more and more. Uh, and, I, and I'm loving it because it is so foundational. It is so important that we understand what do I believe? Like what do I, in this world of craziness and opinions and ideas and goodness gracious, you can Google you know, anything on the planet. I mean, like right now you could Google, you know, um, do, you know, how can you make an ant smell like a banana? And somebody has written an article about it. I mean, just the craziest, weirdest stuff. But when it comes to what we believe or our faith, there's also a bunch of crazy out there stuff like an ant to a banana kind of thing, you know, that, that really, I think brings confusion. And so what we decided over this summer was to take eight weeks and kind of go back to the basics. Like what are some basic realities that we need to make sure that we know what we believe and why? And so we're using something that is the earliest creed used by the Christian church. Uh, it's, a, it's a creed called the Apostles' Creed. And a creed is just a statement. Now let me say this again. This creed is not, it's not sacred. It's not the inspired word of God. It is man written. But the reason it was written was not because it's called the Apostles' Creed, not because the apostles wrote it, but because a group of people said, you know what, the apostles are gone now, and we want to write a summary of things that are basic of what they believed. Because as soon as the apostles weren't there anymore, you started getting these offshoots of, yeah, but what if this, and what if there really isn't a trinity, or what if that, and kind of, and so what they said was, you know what, we need a creed, we need something that summarizes and says, and so that's the Apostles' Creed. So we've been working through the Apostles' Creed as a way for us to go back to the basics of what do I believe? What, what is it that are some of the foundational realities of the faith and what it means to be a Christian? So let me read you uh, a little bit of the Apostles' Creed as, as, as we go. It says, 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Now, we started Father. Uh, that was our week one. Week one, we started talking about what does it mean to be a son or a daughter? What does it mean not to be a slave, right, but to be an heir, a son or a daughter? We talked about Father God and that relationship. If you haven't seen that, you may want to go back and check it out. Week two, we went on, it says creator of heaven and earth. And we talked about God as the creator. And we really got pretty scientific that day in talking about the science that I personally believe the science today points to the creator. The science today points to uh, the fact that, that there is no missing link and that, and that, that really that God created, I believe in seven days, I believe in a, a, a young earth. Uh, I mean, I believe some things that a lot of people would go, what? And it's, it's because we've been programmed through, whether it be Jurassic Park movies, right? About dinosaurs or caveman movies or all these things to believe in things. But what does the Bible say? So we talked about that in week two. Week three, last week, we got into the next part. And I believe in Jesus Christ, the only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And we stopped there last week and we talked about who is Jesus. And we talked a lot about the fact that he not only wants to be your savior and your Lord, but he wants to be your friend. And so, uh, and let me really encourage you. If you're going to go back and watch any of them might be next last week is the one that you would go and really understand the relationship that Jesus wants to have you with you. All right, let me keep going with the creed still talking about Jesus. It says he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the father almighty from there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. So we're going to talk about today. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back in the second coming. And there's all kinds of arguments about the second coming and how that's going to happen and when that's going to happen. Well, let, let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Look at Matthew 24 and 36. But about that day or hour, what does it say? No one knows. So let me say this to you. If you buy a book and somebody tells you when it's going to happen, if you hear somebody that's got some prediction about when it's going to happen, if, if any of that then I need you to hear this. They are completely out of alignment with the Bible. There's, there's nothing biblical about that. No one knows. Look at the rest of it. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. So I've got this picture in my head that Jesus is sitting there and he's looking at the mess that we are in today. And he's going now. No, not yet. Okay. And then and he's like, now, no, not yet. But I, I know Jesus is anxious because of his love that he has for us. But God is waiting for a perfect time. But no one knows, right? No one knows. So what do we do in the meantime? Because come on, y'all, life is crazy, <laughs> right? I mean, the stuff that we see going on around us in this world today and the, and the political mess and the arguing and the bitterness and the, I mean, there's so much that is going on. Well, I want to refer to a, a verse that, that, that kind of gives a shout out to some specific people. It's in first Chronicles 12 and 32. And it says the men of Issachar understood the times and knew what Israel should do. In other words, they understood and they knew what to do. And I think that that's what the church needs is we need to understand the times and then know what we're supposed to do in those times. See, it's not time for us to be scared or worried or confused because of the chaos that's going on. We need to understand the unique time that we live in and then understand what we should be doing. The church has a statement of faith that you can find on our website. But one of the things that I want you to know that is right in the middle of our statement of faith is we believe Jesus is coming again. He, he is coming back. Jesus was born. He lived a life for 30 years or so he, that he could relate to us. That's what we talked about last week. He had a ministry of reconciliation, reconciling God to his people and people to each other and bringing healing to that for three years. He bringing truth to this world and then dying for all the sins of all time. He rose from the dead three days later. And for the next 40 days, he appeared many times to people. And then after the 40 days, he went to heaven. 
This is the account, listen to this, of him going back to heaven as we dive into this. Acts 1 and 9. After he said this, stop. After he said what? Like, that's the question. If, if, if we're going to read what's following, what was in front of it? What was in front of it was basically the Great Commission. This is when he looks at the, at the disciples and he says, and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, which is exactly the way we do our missions, locally, regionally, globally, right? It's, that's the same concept and where we get that from. So after that, after telling them the great commission, he said this, uh, or after he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up in the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Well, I can answer that question because he went up. <laughs> Thank you for Professor Obvious. But, but they're, they, they're kind of making a point. It says, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go to heaven. As a matter of fact, I believe he's coming back to the exact same place as well. Where, where did this happen? Well, this happened on a, something called the Mount of Olives, right? And most of the time, if you see pictures of Jerusalem and you see the, like the wailing wall or the temple and you see with the gold dome, most of those pictures are taken from the Mount of Olives. Uh, so it's right there next to that scenario. And, and as far as I understand in the Bible and I see, he's going to come right back to that place as well. Now look at Luke 20 and 25, because while we don't know when this is going to happen, we do have information in the Bible about the season that this will happen in or what it will look like around it. Look at Luke 21. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, uh, apprehensive of what is coming on the, in the world. Boy, that sounds a little familiar. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, Stand up, lift up your head. This I, I'm going to paraphrase it, Pastor Mike. You better pack your bags, right? Like that, you better get ready. Uh, when this takes place, lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near. Your redemption is drawing near. That reminds me of a, a silly Cajun joke. So there was, there was these two um, kind of backwoods churches that were right across the street from each other. One was Baptist, one was Methodist, these old Cajun, you know, pastors or whatever. So they both decided to partner together to try to help people out. So they put out signs in front of their church and they're putting the signs up, they're nailing them in the ground. And the one sign says, the end is near. And the other one, the sign says, turn yourself around before it's too late, right? About that time, here comes a car, rolls down the window, hollers out, you religious fanatics, you freaks, you are crazy, blah, and Joe blows past. Goes around the corner, all of a sudden they hear, they hear the screeching tires and this big splash. And the one Cajun pastor looks at the others, he says, you think we should have just put bridges out? Right? Like, like in Disney, that's funny, I don't care who you are. But listen to me, here, here's the question I, that, that, that's going to come. Here's the question, if we're talking about end times. Are we living in the last days? Are we living in the last days? Well, every generation has a tendency to make a case that they are living in the last days, right? Just about every generation has books that are written with predictions, has guys on TV that are prophetic, you know, experts, and they are coming up with times and all this kind of thing. Let me ask you a question. Is that such a bad thing? Well, I think it's wrong to put a date on it, but maybe it maintains our focus a little bit, right? Maybe we kind of think of, well, Jesus is going to come back. Eh, maybe that's down the road or something. Maybe we need to stir back up inside of us. Jesus is coming again. And, and, and a question that I would say to you is, do I know whether he's coming back in our generation? I don't. Can I look at the season? and measure that it's possible, I can. Let me show you what I mean. This is not in your notes. I just want to tell you some interesting things. One of the things that you see in Revelation 11 is that there are two witnesses that are going to come back. Okay. And these two witnesses are going to come back. Most scholars believe that it's Elijah and Moses. They're going to come back and they're going to preach the gospel uh, from the temple mount. 
the Antichrist then is going to kill them and their bodies are going to lay out. And the scripture says this, that all the world will see this happen simultaneously. Well, let me ask you, has there ever been a generation since ours that had worldwide, worldwide satellite technology? And the answer is no, right? So for the first time ever in the history of our world, that could be fulfilled in our time. Let me give you another one. Revelations 13, uh, most of us know about this one because this is the mark of the beast thing, right? And it says those who take the mark of the beast will be able to do financial transactions and those that don't will not. Well, this would be, this would require worldwide financial technology, right? Have we ever before had a time period where we had chip technology like we do today? And the answer is no. We're already seeing people do things like put a chip in their hand, right? So that they can check in and out of work or those kind of, those things are already going on right now. And that's because of chip technology that our culture has now that we've never had before. You know, I always get this crazy picture in my head. If you had one of those chips put in your forehead, like, does that mean you do the self checkout at Walmart and you got to like put your face in, you know, to, anyway. Um, but, but in all seriousness, I, I'm, I'm making a joke, but in all seriousness, we didn't, we didn't have this possibility. So that can be fulfilled. Let me give you one more example. Matthew 24 and 14 says the gospel will be preached in all nations. Now that word nations does not mean the geographical boundary nations that we're talking about. The actual word in the original language is ethnos, which means all people groups will have the gospel preached to them. Well, have we ever had the opportunity like we do today? I mean, even as I'm, you're watching this, you could be watching this anywhere in the world as long as you have internet, right? So like never before, we are a generation that has the possibility to, to, to do worldwide evangelism. Matter of fact, there are somewhere around 17,000 people groups um, in the nation. Currently, 10,000 of those people groups have scripture churches and missionaries that are reaching their people groups. There's about 7,000 that are unreached. Okay. I need you to hear something. The gospel is growing. The gospel is growing. We're, we're seeing more and more and more. It may not be in your specific location, or it may seem somewhat stagnant, but when we look at the world picture, it's growing. That is why we feel called to do the least amount for ourselves as church of the lakes that we might be able to serve others right? That, that's, that's the whole vision of that, that we can put money out and serve others. So why are we talking about this? Well, I'm, I'm not talking about this to scare you, right? I am matter of fact, I, I think that the coming back of Jesus should do three things. One, I think Jesus return should comfort us, right? There are many of you that as I'm even right now, as I'm teaching that you would honestly say life stinks, Life is frustrating. Life is hard. I'm, I'm fighting depression or I'm, I'm battling some, some sickness or illness. And listen to me. I pray that God does earth miracles in your situation, but we all have to hold on to the reality that heaven is the greatest miracle, right? Some glad morning we are going home, right? Listen to me. There are no handicap parking doctor's appointments or negative diagnosis. There are no relationship drama or rejection. There's, there's, there's no more addiction or prescription drugs. There's no more taxes. Hallelujah. There's no more elections. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen on that one? Right? Listen to me. Don't get fixated on this earth. That's what, why we're talking about it today. Don't get fixated on this earth. This earth will let you down. It's not about here. It's not about quality of life on earth. It's about eternity, man. Let me show you first Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that you who are still alive, okay, who are left until the coming of the Lord, there it is that he's coming back again, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Notice that it doesn't even say they've died. It just says they've fallen asleep. You know, in other words, they live forever right? That's just interesting. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we are still alive. There are going to be people who are still alive when Jesus comes back, second coming, and are they, they will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's really why I read that whole thing was for that last line. 
We need to encourage each other and take comfort in. Of course, this world stinks. We're sinners. We're surrounded by sinners. The world is out of order because of sin in the beginning. So we have chaos, but we have heaven to look for, right? Your life is about this long. And if you go from my thumb forever beyond what you can see on this screen and on and on and on, that is eternity. You have this amount of time that we live in this and we struggle and, 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 and we deal with the things we deal with that we might find eternity forever. Let me say it to you this way. Florida, Florida is obviously one of the best places on the planet to live right now. And, and I'm not being funny and that's not a bias. That's just a reality. We were open before anybody else. Right. I think our governor did a phenomenal job with vaccines and, and when to wear masks and we're not to. Ma I mean, it is obviously one of the best places you could have been over the last year and a half. But can I say this to you? Heaven is better. One of our problems is we make life here so comfortable that we are not looking forward to the reality of how much better heaven is actually is. What, what else does it do? Why are we talking about it? Well, Jesus return prepares us, right? God does not want us to be in the dark about this reality. There are over 300 references in the new Testament to Jesus coming back. 216 out of the 260 chapters of the new Testament refer to Jesus coming back. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer. Why does this matter? God wants us to have some comfort and preparation, but not in fear of the unknown, but in preparation for what he has already planned for us, right? We should be encouraged by that. So let me read on 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4. Now, brothers and sisters, he's talking to Christians here, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write it for you. Why? Because we don't know when it's going to happen, right? We don't know. For you all know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It's just going to happen out of nowhere while people are saying peace and safety. People, in other words, those are not, not believers. And they're going to be saying peace. Oh, everything's good. Everything's good. You know, go buy you this and go buy that. Enjoy life. And it's all about your quality of life and feeling good and comfort and, and all these things. Look, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark so that this day should, should would surprise you. In other words, I want you to be prepared, right? There will There will be shock, but not by his church. There will be shock when he comes, but not by those who understand the plan. There will be many that, that Jesus' return will, will take off guard. Well, I'm not ready. I didn't know, right? And so I would say to you this way. In other words, how you live matters, right? We all need to wake up and call uh, this, this wake-up call to refocus uh, what our life is all about. Let me say it to you this way. How many of you have ever been a part of helping prepare for a wedding. Okay. Holy cow. That's a lot of work, right? Oh my gosh. Like, you know, you think you got it and then there's something else and then there's the catering and then the cake and blah, blah. I mean, even as I'm saying this, Lizzie, my assistant who's filming, she's nodding her head because she just got married not that long ago. So all that craziness is really fresh on her mind, which is why I've looked at my three girls that are getting towards that age. And, and we have talked about something called an elopement bonus, <laughs> dad, which my mom, my, my wife does not like that at all, but, uh, Hey, there's an elopement bonus. If you'd like to, uh, and of course I'm kidding, but you know what it is to prepare, right? Well, listen, we are the bride of Christ. We are preparing for a wedding or are we, are we thinking that way? In other words, how we live matters. Let me say it to you this way. If the groom, if the groom is all focused on the preparation and, and got, got all his stuff together and he's all focused, but the bride is not doing anything. Like I want you to picture like she's still living the single life. Matter of fact, she's still dating. Not, not really planned any bridesmaids. She hadn't chosen a dress. Um, doesn't really know what she wants for the reception, not preparing spiritually. Would you say we have a problem? Of course you would say we have a problem, but listen to me, 
We are the bride of Christ. Are we preparing? We should be living completely focused on a wedding and all the preparation that it takes to show up to that wedding ready for the wedding, right? This, this is why coming up in, uh, in September and October, we're going to study the book of Daniel. How do we live in a pagan world and yet live faithful to God? And, that, and, and that's why we're going to study that as sort of a follow-up of this. So, so also, what, why are we talking about this? Well, because Jesus' return focuses us, right? We need to refocus on a wedding. We need to refocus on who we are, how we live matters, and what we're doing. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 through 6. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be aware and sober. All right, so let me go back to the question. Are we living in the last days? You are living in your last days. And I am living in my last days. If I said yes to that question, would it change the way you lived? Well, then yes. You are living in your last days and I am living in my last days. So let us be sober. Let us be awake. We are the bride of Christ in preparation. Look at Matthew 24, 37. When the son of man returns, it will be like it was in, the, in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time of Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen till the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. So you too must keep watch. For you don't know. What day your Lord is coming? Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, <laughs> he would keep watch. Yeah, right? No kidding. If I knew a burglar was coming to my house, I'm going to keep watch. And I'm going to have my two friends with me. Come on, Smith and Wesson. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like, of course, you're, you would be prepared. He would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready at all times for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Are we in the last days? I don't know, but I'm in my last days and you are in your last days. So we have to think like we're in the last days. We have to think like a bride preparing for a wedding, right? Am I doing everything that I can do to make this day special and make this day what it's supposed to be? Okay, Pastor Mike, I'm hearing you. I'm, I'm hearing you. So what should I do? All right. Number one, I should think clearly. I should think clearly. In other words, my mind has got to be aligned to this reality, right? First Peter four and seven, the end of all things is near. Therefore be clear minded and self control so that you can, what's the word there? Pray. Prayer, prayer is critical to your thinking. Prayer should be the moment of your day where your mind is realigned. You ever been in a car that the alignment's jacked up and the wheel does the wah, 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 or you can feel the wah, 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 wah. And eventually what happens is if you don't fix that, it will cause other problems, right? It'll jack up the tires. It might jack up the suspension, whatever. Like you can have other problems. Prayer is about realigning our mind with God. Going into prayer, we're mad, we're frustrated, we're scared. Maybe we're all kinds of different things. When we come out of prayer, things are different because our mind is realigned. That, that's what prayer does. In other words, let me say it to you this way. Prayer is not just a place for you to inform God about earth. Prayer is a place for God to inform you about eternity. Come on, let me, I'm going to say that again, because that's good. Prayer is not a place for you to inform God about what's going on on earth. Prayer is the place where God informs you about eternity, where you get realigned. Colossians says, set your mind on things above. That's what it means, that we don't get so fixated on this earth that we lose sight of the fact that he is coming again. If we are living in the end times, then I need to realign my mind to eternity. Number two, 
I should focus on relationships. Let me ask you a question. Anything and everything in this life, what matters most? You know what the answer is? I think there's one answer. I think it's one true answer for everybody. People. People. Why, why would you say people, Pastor Mike? Because a lot of things I think are important. This, because you know what? People are the only thing that go to heaven. People are the only thing that live forever. All the rest of this, this TV, this table, this shirt, this computer, cars, all this stuff, all of it goes away. But people, people are the only thing that left. So I should focus on relationships. If I'm realigning my mind to the reality of Jesus coming back and eternity, then what's important in eternity is people and, and what happens with them, right? So that's why we serve even when people are difficult. Come on, you ever serve somebody who was difficult? You ever done something with somebody and they didn't appreciate it? Right? You ever had somebody like had that entitlement mentality with you and you're just like, well, fine, I ain't giving you jack then. Like we get frustrated with it. But listen to me. We serve even when people are difficult because we realign our mind to the fact that the, the, this is the only thing in this whole scene that I'm standing in right now. This person is the only thing that is going to matter in eternity. Right? We join small groups in, even when people are difficult. Why? Because we need each other. Look at 1 Peter 4, 8, and 9. Above all, love each other. Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. You were never intended to live life alone. We need each other. Why do we need each other? Well, because you're going to fall. You're going to blow it. Well, Pastor Mike, why don't you be more positive? Okay, I'm positive. You're going to fall. I'm absolutely positive you're going to blow it. And you're going to need somebody. You're going to need somebody to be there, all right? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to give you one last blank in the notes there um, to fill in here. What, 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 how should I respond? How do I, knowing that Jesus is going to come back, what do I do? I think the third one is this, is that I should make a difference. For whatever days I have left, whether Jesus comes back this afternoon, or he comes back five years from now, or he comes back a hundred years from now. I should be focused on making a difference with the time that I have left and the giftings and what he's given me to do. First Peter 4 and 10, each one of you, you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. He has gifted you that you might serve others. Why? Because people are what really matter. Faithfully administrating God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Or, or, amen. So let me let me sum it up this way. I didn't put this in your notes, but let me give you four things that I would sum, sum this up with. We know Jesus is coming back. We've walked through this, looked at the scripture. We don't know the time, but we do know the season. And, and do we have enough things within our season right now to say he could come back right now? I believe absolutely. Can he come back 100 or 200 years from now? Absolutely. But in the meantime, we are a people who are an eternal people, not a temporary earth people, right? We talk about this is not our home. So, so what should we do? I think first we, we got to live for heaven. You got to live your life for heaven, not for this life. We've got to stand for truth, uh, no matter what, even when we're persecuted or we're the one person. I just had this conversation um, with, with Pastor Doug on our staff the other day, and, and we were talking about some of the specific issues that the church is battling on now. And that a lot of the church, there's a lot of liberal things coming into church. And it, he gave this visual that I thought was so amazing. He said, it's like a big wave that comes and crashes on the shore. And then when it goes away, it pulls everything, but just leaves a few things. We, sometimes we are going to have to be those people because right now the wave of culture is pulling people away from biblical standards and away from biblical things. And sometimes we're going to be the one left on the shore. And it's going to be like that where we're looking around going, am I really the only one that believes this anymore that reads this in the book we're gonna have to stand for truth we're gonna have to share the gospel why because people matter right and they need to hear the gospel and they need to have the opportunity uh, to to share in eternity with us and then we got to prepare for Jesus 
He's coming. Could be tomorrow. Could be next week. Could be 10 years, 100 years, 200 years. But you know what? We're going to live our lives for eternity. We're going to do the best we can to make a difference, focusing on relationships, doing what he has called us to do because he is coming again. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your word and this reminder. God, that you would stoke our passion and the fire inside of us to live for eternity, to know Jesus, you're coming back. And we want to be the bride that is prepared. We want to be prepared in all things that when we, when you come back, there is no regret. There is no fear. There is joy because we are prepared to meet you in that place. Thank you that you love us enough to come back for us. You don't have to do that, but you love us that way. Let us show our appreciation back to you by loving you back in the way that we serve uh, with this life that you have given us. Father, thank you for your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Man, I hope you guys have a great week. And I hope this week you'll take a few minutes to pray with the idea of realigning your mind. You'll focus on relationships and then you'll stop and look around you and say, What am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to make a difference? Have a great week. We'll see you next week.